Okay, so now we're going to measure the two port impedance of a voltage regulator plane. And it's going to be a low impedance, so we've connected our coaxial transformer. And then we have two ports both connected to the power plane. In this case, we have the power plane connected to our linear regulator, and we have two output capacitors on the linear regulator, one of the ceramics and one of the tantalums. Ideally, we'd like these cables to be shorter uh, for the reasons that we talked about earlier, uh, but this is convenient for us. And so we can see here's the capacitance that we have connected to the regulator. Here's the ESR of the capacitors. Here's the inductance of the power planes and ultimately the resonance created by the decoupling capacitors that are on the clock circuit. And so right now we have no power applied and we can go ahead and we can save that measurement to memory and we'll apply power and then we can see the difference. And so now that we've applied power, we can see we have a very low resistance and I can even optimize that. So here's the resistance of our voltage regulator. Here's the effective inductance of the control loop. You can see now we have a relatively large peak, which tells us that we have poor stability. And then we can see the minimum ESR from the capacitors. There's something else that's interesting that we can see in this picture, and that is that since the falling slopes are capacitors, we can notice that this falling slope actually shifted to the right almost a factor of two. And what that tells us is that the ceramic capacitors are significantly smaller now because of the DC bias effect. And so we can see that that impedance and its series resonance moved. And then once we get past the resonance of the capacitors, you can see the ESL is unaffected and you can still see the resonance that's created uh, by the decoupling capacitors at the uh, clock circuit. In the same way, we can also measure this same impedance in our point of load circuit. And so if we switch over to the point of load circuit, we can do the same thing and we can go ahead and remove power Let's disconnect the capacitors from the plane, and we can go ahead and update that memory. And so now we can see the capacitors that are on the switching regulator. We can see the series resistance, and again, we can see inductance of the planes that now connect from the switching regulator to the clock, and also the resonance that's created by the decoupling and the plane that connects the regulators together. And if we go ahead and apply power now, now we'll see the low resistance of the switching regulator. We'll see its effective inductance. You can see the peak that's created by the relatively poor stability. And we'll also see the capacitive minima. And then again, the inductance of the plane and the resonance of the decoupling capacitors on the clock. And that's the two-port measurement. That's how we measure impedance of voltage regulators. And this is the fundamental and primary measurement of power integrity. Um, one of the things that you will notice is that we keep talking about how flat this needs to be. And obviously, this isn't flat. So for us to improve this uh, power plane impedance, we'd want to bring all the peaks down and all the minimas up. And we'd want to end up with a relatively flat line. And so we'll go ahead and we'll look at that next. All right, so in this demonstration, we're showing a switching regulator designed for flat impedance. Uh, we're making a two-port measurement. It's relatively low impedance, so we have our coaxial transformer. Again, we'd like to use shorter connections, but for this demonstration, uh, this is convenient. The two cables both connect to SMA connectors, and the SMA connectors are both connected directly to the output of the switching regulator. And so with the power off, we can just about see the load resistors. There's about a half an ohm. Um, that's our two load resistors on the board. Then we can see the capacitance. We can see the ESR of the capacitor, and we can see the inductance. Uh, we can actually tell that this is a polymer aluminum capacitor because it's relatively pointy. We don't see that characteristic uh, frequency-dependent ESR that you see in a standard electrolytic or a standard uh, tantalum capacitor. But there it is. We can save that impedance to memory. And then we can apply power. And when we apply power, we'll end up with our one volt power rail. And we'll give this a chance to sweep. And now we can see that 
at the one kilohertz point where our coaxial transformer is pretty good, we end up with a flat impedance and uh, we can set that to about 10 kilohertz. Um, so that impedance is down approximately 19 or 20 milliohms. Then we can see the inductance of the regulator here. And then we can see the matching of the planes. The bandwidth is, is right about the point that those two curves intersect. The fact that there is no big peak tells us that we have an extremely stable control loop. In fact, we know that it's about 90 degrees. And then above that point, it's going to follow that impedance. How flat this impedance ends up being is a function of our control loop, the slope compensation ramp signal, and the exact value of the capacitor. And so we could flatten this a little bit by changing our control loop slightly and by tuning it better to match the capacitors. We've built about 50 of these boards and they vary quite a bit, um, but they're still relatively flat. And that variance is a function of the control loop of the uh, amplifier in the switching regulator and also the ESR characteristics of the electrolytic capacitor. So there will be some variance, but these are pretty flat by any standard. And that's, that's how we measure flat impedance VRMs. And that's what we really want it to look like. Of course, the lower we can get this capacitor inductance to be, the smaller the decoupling capacitors would be. So we typically also do uh, use parallel capacitors and low ESR uh, and low ESL tandem electrolytic to try to minimize the decoupling capacitors. OK, so in this demonstration, uh, we're connected to our uh, point of load regulator. And we're connected through a uh, line injector, J2120 line injector. So we have wall adapter power coming in. And then we have power connected to our uh, switching regulator through these two clips. We're measuring the input signal modulation through channel 2 using our oscilloscope probe. And we're measuring the output voltage of the regulator through this coaxial cable. The coaxial cable is nice because it gives us a lot of uh, signal attenuation and the fact that it's unity gain makes it a low noise measurement. And it's a 50 ohm cable, so we also do have it terminated into 50 ohms. And now we can see the PSOR. And what we're interested in is just the low frequency number. And so in this case, we have a flat PSR at low frequency of about 43.7 dB. And that number actually tells us the uh, size of the internal slope compensation signal. So even though most pulse width modulators don't specify the amplitude of the slope compensator signal, we can actually determine it from the PSR measurement. Uh, and when we create our, our uh, simulation model, the simulation model has two large dependencies. One is on the power stage transconductance, and the other one is on the slope compensator signal. And those show up in both the output impedance measurement and also the PSR measurement. So by using two measurements, PSR and output impedance, we can solve for both the power stage transconductance of the regulator and also the slope compensation signal. And between those two measurements, we now have enough information to populate our simulation model. And we also learned how to measure capacitors. We learned how to take the capacitor measurement and save it as a touchstone file, and also how to create a, a broadband SPICE model from it. And so now from our measurements, we have enough information to create a high fidelity simulation model that includes our capacitors, the slope compensator signal, the power stage transconductance, and ultimately give us a perfect uh, representation of our switching regulator for optimization.